Hello, North Alabama, and welcome to the Fox 54 Week in Review. I'm Kenesha Dees. We have nearly 40 minutes of all local headlines to keep you informed through your weekend. Here's just a portion of what you'll see this week. It's a wing thing, and it was one man's thing for wings that led to friends and family creating a chicken wing festival in his honor. We have this sweet story with a kick. Madison County is among the top 10 in Alabama when it comes to hospitality and tourism. We'll speak with officials about the magic ingredients keeping the Rocket City and surrounding areas as hot spots. And UAH has new faculty taking charge of Chargers basketball. Mo will be in with a word from the new head coaches in the weekend sports. We'll start our weekly recap in Montgomery, where yet again, the licensing of medical marijuana businesses in the state of Alabama has been put on another legal hold. The gold ticket medical cannabis here in Alabama has seen its share of ups and downs, and this latest round of legal battles seem to have put another pause in the process. Arkin McCoy spoke with the Alabama Cannabis Industry Association on where they are now. Those who have been working to get medical cannabis here in Alabama feel a little bit frustrated. This after the latest round of legal action in the process to have medical marijuana here in the state was approved. There definitely is litigation and a lot of it that's going on in the courtroom right now. And uh, one of the main things that's happening is that it is causing We've got a restraining order that's placed on the dispensary, the individual dispensary license, and the vertically integrated license, which were the license that I could, you could say that Alabama did get right. So those are also being restrained right now, meaning that the judge has not issued the license. They may have been awarded, but they have not been issued yet. Also, a bill that gives the Alabama Medical Cannabis Commission more rights to regulate medical marijuana passed in the House and is headed to the Senate. House Bill 390 will give the commission primary responsibility when regulating and licensing the drug. Additionally, AMCC works with the Alabama Department of Agriculture and Industries to award distribution license. Shea Garrigan with the Alabama Cannabis Industry Association explains how all this has been affecting the process. There's been a lot of different change ups. So it's it's just, you know, we've had about three different licensing choices throughout this, throughout this period, throughout almost about a nine month period. And so I would say that the guys that have applied have gotten a little bit, you know, probably a little bit of PTSD from it. And what they want most? At this point, we really just want to do whatever we can do to get this product out to the patients because this was something that started um, in 2021 mm -hmm. and we are here in 2024 right now and we do not have the first product on the shelf. Nor at this point, the way things are, we don't have a timeline as to when we know if it's going to be actually, if they're going to be... Um, able to do this anytime soon. We don't have any type of um, indication that that would happen soon without any type of legislative fix like we have right now. For Fox 54 News, I'm Ken McCoy. All right, a big announcement coming out of Limestone County today. A manufacturing company for solar panels could be in the works thanks to millions of dollars in investments. Our Jasmine Bird tells us more about it and what this means for our local economy. It's a $10 million, uh, $10 million capital investment and it's about 70 jobs. Limestone County Economic Development Association President and CEO Bethany Shockney is referring to Omco Solar. Which was a company that supports a larger company in another county over in Lawrence County. They support First Solar, which was a $1.1 billion project announced a couple of years ago. Omco is one of the nation's largest manufacturers of steel structures for solar panels and is leasing a building in Huntsville West Industrial Park for the production of solar tracking. Every time we have a company like this, this is another prime example of the opposite of what we're typically used to. We have a company that supports as a tier supplier to a, to a company outside of our area, and in this case, a couple of counties over. So that's a Prime example of rising water raises all ships for us from an industrial standpoint. And it doesn't stop there. Limestone County was also just selected as a silver level select site for CSX. What that does is it gets us some special recognition. It gets us on a special list for those companies that may be looking for a rail site that have that specific requirement because there are very few of those. So we have one of those that are available and it's the only one in North Alabama. Which means it makes us more marketable. Um, it also, when, when you already have certain infrastructure in place, and, and in this case, we do have a rail spur already in place, that aids in speed to market for any company that's coming to the area. In Athens, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54 News. 
Well, it's the end of an era for Florence. The city's police chief, Ron Tyler, announced he's retiring. Chief Tyler announced on the official Florence Police Facebook page a video message to the community. He said that while his retirement won't be official until after January 1st of next year, his last day of chief will be June 28th of this year. After that, he will be on approved leave and says he will be handling some medical issues. He spoke about his law enforcement team and how honored he is to have served his city. Um, I can assure you of this. Uh, it's been a uh, it's, it's been a focal point of our department to never have a single point of failure. I am 100% confident that there are men and women behind me in this police department who are able to step right in and take this police department to uh, to greater heights. All right, definitely wishing him well in his retirement. Congratulations. Tyler served as police chief for 12 years. If you have a passion for the arts, listen up. Arts Huntsville needs volunteers for the 2024 Panoply Arts Festival. It kicks off next Friday. More than a thousand volunteers are needed at Big Spring Park. Volunteer shifts vary in length and are available in every area of the park. This includes art and steam interactives to gateway greeters and face painting. We need people in different areas, you know, we have the stores, you have gateways, you know, you have signage and all types of things. So, you know, we need volunteers to help with face painting and just a lot of the activities and crafts and things that we have going on. So you can be 14 with a parent to volunteer uh, and pretty much you just reach out to us, sign up on our website. All right, and as she said, parents, if your kid wants to volunteer, they'll need your permission. Volunteers will gain free admission to enjoy the festival before or after their shift. <music> It's been a long-awaited announcement, and now we finally know the name of Huntsville's Music Festival. Drum roll! The South Star Music Festival. It'll make its way to John Hunt Park in September, and we have a peek at the genre of music. The festival revealed on Facebook that the fest will, quote, celebrate nostalgic pop and rock anthems. The lineup of artists is coming soon. We'll keep you updated on that as well. What we hear a lot is, um, I really didn't know uh, everything about Huntsville until I got here. Welcome to Huntsville, where we have the Bob Brown Center and the Orion, and plus many concerts, conferences, and festivals. We just had a, a very uh, successful uh, pop culture and uh, comic activity. I think there were over 22,000 who participated in that. You look at all of those activities, in addition to the, the sporting events and other um, activities, there's just really a lot for, for both residents and visitors alike to, uh, to enjoy. The Alabama Tourism Department released its annual 2023 Alabama Tourism Impact Report. The state did have $23.5 billion in impact. Uh, North Alabama and specifically Madison County had more than $2.4 billion just in Madison County. There were more than uh, 2.7 million uh, visitors who stayed in hotel rooms. Uh, restaurants saw a, a good portion of that. And there's a good reason for the growth in hospitality. There are uh, increasing numbers of hotels uh, and more rooms available, not only in the downtown area, but also, uh, you know, there's we're going to have a music festival here in September. So uh, they will be, um, all those visitors will be staying really community-wide. But that impact also helped the people living in Madison County. So according to the Alabama uh, Tourism Department, uh, more than 23,000 jobs in Madison County are either directly or indirectly linked to travel. Uh, and the economic impact, that $2.4 billion, uh, that saved uh, every household in Madison County from having to uh, pay more than $1,300 in taxes last year. So if people wonder what the um, economic impact is, how does that uh, affect me? That's how it affects the, the standard homeowner. For Fox 54 News, I'm Kim McCoy. All right, the WIC program is celebrating 50 years of helping families, and this week Alabama's income guidelines for SNAP's WIC program have increased. This means more families qualify. If you've had a baby in the past six months or currently breastfeeding, you qualify. If you're a parent or a guardian of a child five years or younger, you qualify too. You're encouraged to contact your local county health department or WIC agency to apply. You know, say there's just one income in the household, dad works, mom stays home with the child and is also pregnant, you know, dad can make 57,000 um, 
or a little bit more than 57000 a year, and they could qualify for WIC. If the father can apply for WIC for his child, even if he's not single, you know, even if the father wants to come in and um, bring the child in, that is totally acceptable. All right, well, this new income change opens up qualification for people who make a little more than $2,000, or excuse me, $2,000 more compared to last year. We talked with Steve Perkins' brother, Nick Perkins, months ago about him lobbying for transparency and the release of police body camera footage. It's a proposed bill named after Steve and Jawan Dallas. Today, the bill did not pass. Or Jasmine Bird hears from Nick on what's next. Senator Marie Coleman had introduced a body cam bill, uh, the Jawan Dallas and Steve Perkins Act, that would allow for body cam footage to become public or become a public record uh, within 30 days after a police involved shooting. Right now, families do not have the right to immediate access of police body cam footage. We were denied body cam footage um, for at least the first four months. Um, the current bill or current law allows for Aaliyah to actually decide if they want to release that body cam footage. And Aaliyah did not. They did not. Um, I was actually seen or shown uh, body cam footage from our local DA, uh, Mr. Scott Anderson. Nicholas Perkins is the brother of Steve Perkins. Steve was shot and killed by Decatur police officer on September 29th. Nicholas believes this bill would give families a sense of relief. A sense of knowing what may or may not have happened to their loved one uh, in the unfortunate incident that uh, they're involved in a police involved shooting and um, and their loved one passes away. Um, During this morning's hearing, the Judiciary Committee expressed several opinions on both sides of the aisle in support of the bill. I would supportive of that, I believe, last year, and I think that was a, a pretty good uh, piece of legislation there so that the family members could actually know what happens. Whatever we involve the judge and let the judge decide, um, but we don't run into stonewalling. Yes. Of and some legislators shared opinions not in support of the bill. I can think of two cases. One I'm, I'm currently involved in that if the body cam got out early, the whole prosecution, it would have hurt both sides bad. People don't understand, but that's why you have both things on the scale of justice. The person charged is just has just as much right as justice and reasonable justice as the person who's the victim, too. The bill did not pass the Judiciary Committee to go to the floor. The vote four in favor and eight opposed. But Senator Coleman and Nicholas Perkins are not giving up. Mrs. Perkins and even um, Nicholas's brother and um, listening to Mrs. Dallas, who did view the body cam video of her son, um, and can't sleep because of it. But six months of waiting is just way too long. We're, we're, we're glad that they were open uh, to those options and ideas. Um, so it made us feel very good about progress, possible progress that can be made. In Huntsville, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54 News. Alabama a and University leaders say they're doing all they can to make sure students feel safer on campus. The school implementing new safety measures that'll hopefully ease fears about weapons showing up on campus. Our Ken McCoy spoke with the campus police chief on how student input made some of these changes possible. Campus Chief Montez Payton spoke on the school's response in regards to safety after a shooting in March. As you know, we had a situation last August, and so we had already been operating in that. Um, and so we will continue to, to build those efforts, continue to increase patrols uh, for, for our campus to make sure our students know uh, they're safe. Now, those efforts to increase patrols and add more security comes as a part of a $600,000 investment into campus safety. We initially started with outdoor cameras uh, to elevate the level of coverage on campus. So now we're expanding into uh, our bomb detection, uh, gun detection canine. Uh, we've also invested in a new substation that'll be on this side of campus, as well as we've contracted some uh, security personnel to assist us with our patrols. Alabama a and had two school shootings happen on campus within a year's time. I asked Chief Payton, what are those conversations with students been like? The level of concern regarding uh, firearms is, is extremely concerning for them. And the addition of weapon detecting canines looked to ease that fear. That was part of the main reason why we wanted to salute the services of a, a canine that could detect those things. Uh, we, we understand with uh, new laws passing, it gives more access to firearms, but we wanted to find a way to, to curb those things with a canine that's not as intrusive 
um, besides putting up, you know, monitors and things like that. But a canine will, will serve its purpose in doing that. Payton also shared a message about student support. Our role and our job and responsibility is to make sure this campus is safe. These situations are occurring more frequently as we see. Uh, but what we want to do is get in front of it uh, as quickly as possible because we want our students to be able to learn in, in an environment where they feel safe and secure. Um, we appreciate their support. We appreciate their feedback uh, to helping us do that. Chief Payton also shares that many of these initiatives are already in action. And you can read more at our website at fox54.com. Here at Alabama a and Ken McCoy, Fox 54 News. We're thrilled, to, honestly, to have Chapman Elementary. We really I would love to welcome them with open arms. Huntsville City Schools unveiled their proposed 10-year capital plan, which is divided up into five focus areas, or what they call feeder patterns. A part of this plan would potentially have Chapman Elementary School students consolidating to Blossomwood Elementary. But there is a concern. So for three school years, once the Chapman kids come over, Prior to the new middle school being built, will rising sixth graders zoned for Chapman Middle, will they leave after fifth grade or will they stay on in the sixth grade while the sixth grade is still at Blossomwood? And the reason I'm concerned is I fear that this split of the feeder pattern may be off-putting to Chapman neighborhood families. Parents and those in the community of the Lee and New Century feeder pattern in which this merger will affect met to discuss this topic. I am really concerned about this plan having my child crossing feeder patterns for a few years. She would be at Chapman for elementary for a few years, then she would be at Blossomwood Elementary for a few years, then she would be back at Chapman Middle. That's definitely an anomaly in the district, and I, I think in most districts, you, that's not best practice. Dr. Sutton, superintendent for the district, explains the thought process behind the merger. One thing we did consider is the capacity issues that we have with our schools, travel, we look at the condition of the building. Um, and currently, Chapman has 130 students, uh, and that's counting pre-K. We did look at the per pupil ratio. Um, currently, we spend over $20,000 per pupil at Chapman Elementary, uh, where the average is seven between seven and 9,000. We do want those students to go to a wonderful education experience in the building. We determined that Blossom Wood was a wonderful building who has capacity, that the neighborhoods are so close and aligned that it, it can merge. So that's where that decision came from. For Fox 54 News, I'm Kim McCoy. Now, Fox 54 Top Teacher, sponsored by Calhoun Community College. Today, we take you to New Market, where we meet a teacher who loves her littles. Others can see it. In fact, they say she is simply the best. Meet first grade teacher, Mrs. Sabrina Rice from New Market School. Now. Welcome to. So we are going to review before we take our little quiz today. Mrs. Sabrina Rice's class. I love, love first grade. She's been teaching first grade for five years and teaching overall for 20. Have always, like I would go home and play school for hours. Like I always wanted to be a teacher. And uh, so here I am. Rice loves her littles because she believes it's a real exciting time for kids to learn. They soak everything in. So that part has been fun. But it's just watching them at the beginning. Then you get to watch them grow. Her assistant principal, okay. Anthony Davison, sees the light she brings to her classroom. Mrs. Rice is phenomenal with her students and her families all together. Um, I've been here two years, and in my two years, she, I've seen her do amazing things with students. She's always calm. She's always collected. Um, she's inquisitive. She wants to know about her children. She wants to know what's happening with them and how she can further assist them. Davison says she gets creative with her students, incorporating their interests to help them learn. You know, just even in discussion and vocabulary, and you have to tie it to something that they're familiar with in order for them to understand it. She does admit, though, sometimes the education journey can be a struggle. Sometimes your classes are bigger and, you know, there's but hey, there's a lot of outside factors that just come into the classroom, you know, and then they are, they are required to know a lot and keeping their attention. But Rice says what it's her kids' to desire now, to learn and the growth that follows, that's worth it in the end. I get them exactly where I want them and then they leave me, you know, at the end of the year because, you know, they are like so much more independent now than when they come in.
Oh, congratulations, Mrs. Rice. Check out the moment she was surprised as top teacher and go ahead and nominate one at fox54.com. Well, the Decatur Morgan County Chamber recognized this month's superstar teacher today. An Eastwood Elementary School teacher took home the award. Miss O'Hare has taught for 17 years and has been at Eastwood for three. She loves the littles. This year she's teaching kindergarten and the two years before that she taught first graders. She was nominated by the school's principal, Luke Burgesson. Here's Miss O'Hare's reaction to being awarded superstar teacher. I was not expecting this at all and it feels amazing. Teaching is a profession that is rewarding in so many different ways, but it does feel really good to have, um, to be seen by your administrator and the community um, because teaching is a work of your heart and you're giving it all you got. So it's nice to know that people are, are seeing that. It made me feel inspired. And it made me feel like when I'm like older, I feel like I want to cosplay more and explore more. The Rocket City's annual comic and pop culture expo is back for the ninth year, tailored to all things comic and pop culture. So I, I started to make my hat when I was nine. Justice Cook dressed as Freddy Fazbear from Five Nights at Freddy's is now 11. I used like newspaper and then I used a bunch of tissue and what you do is you combine that together. For Justice's father Andre dressed as Star Trek officer, this expo is an event they take time to enjoy as a family. There's not a lot of people uh, that, like uh, of melanin that actually do cosplay. Basically sometimes because of, of the fear to do it, uh, uh, being that we may not fit in and like I urge people, you know, no matter who you are, what color your skin is, to, to, to get out, try it, do it, have fun. Special guests like actors George Takei from Star Trek and Oscar Nunez from The Office were also in attendance. River Treyweek is dressed in his own custom rendition of a character from the Assassin's Creed video game series. He is the first member of his family to actually take up the remnants of the Creed. For Treyweek, this expo is all about having a like-minded tribe and community. My friend over there, that uh, he's another assassin. I don't know the dude very personally. I met him at an anime fest last year, and here we are riding to Huntsville, Alabama. He's just one big happy family. Who doesn't love being part of a family? In Huntsville, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54 News. A viewer in Falkville sent us these photos of campaign signs attached to a stop sign above State Highway 36, along with a statement claiming that, quote, there is a federal code stating this is a crime. So let's verify. Our sources are the right-of-way and environment subchapter of the Federal Highway Administration Code, research by a writer for First Amendment rights blog Freedom Forum, and Tony Harris, Chief of Communications and Government Relations with LDOT. Here's what we found. Federal codes prohibit political signs or advertising of any sort within 660 feet of the nearest edge of the right-of-way, but this applies to interstate highways, not state highways or roads. And in rural areas, these signs cannot be visible at all from the interstate itself. As Freedom Forum says, most states and cities restrict signs other than official traffic information signs from state highways because of potential safety hazards. ALDOT's Tony Harris confirms state law prohibits political signs on designated state highways. So, while political signs attached to poles or other signage along the state highway could be subject to removal by ALDOT, they are not violating federal laws. With your Verify, I'm Chase McPherson. The most recent solar eclipse to occur has had mixed responses as to if solar eclipses are a rare occurrence or not. Some say it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience, and while that may be true for some, solar eclipses occur more than we think. So let's verify. Our sources are NASA and NOAA. And here's what we found. Solar eclipses aren't a rare event that take place. In fact, solar eclipses occur about every 18 months. There are two types of eclipses, solar and lunar, and four different types of solar eclipses, total, annular, partial, and hybrid. Let's define just exactly what an eclipse is. An eclipse per NASA is an awe-inspiring celestial event that drastically changes the appearance of the two biggest objects we see in our sky, our sun and moon. On Earth, people can experience solar and lunar eclipses when Earth, the moon, and the sun line up. 
A solar eclipse occurs when the moon passes in between the Earth and the sun, therefore obscuring the sun, whereas a lunar eclipse occurs when the moon moves into Earth's shadow, causing the moon to become darkened. While there may be some truth to the statement when it comes to a total solar eclipse, as only certain areas will be in the path of totality and the path changes each time of occurrence, solar eclipses as a whole are not a rare sight to see. The next total solar eclipse to happen will be on August 12, 2026 for the Arctic, Eastern Greenland, Iceland, and Northern Spain areas. Despite occurring approximately twice a year worldwide, the next total solar eclipse anticipated in the United States won't happen until March the 30th, 2033, which will be visible from northwestern Alaska. Subsequently, another is expected to traverse parts of Canada, Montana, and the Dakotas on August the 23rd, 2044. However, it won't be until August the 12th, 2045, when we see one span the United States from California to Florida. With your Verify, I'm meteorologist Emily Owen. Being a part of the medical staff in a hospital. She wakes up at 5.15 every morning, eats her breakfast. You tend to be on your feet a lot. We don't walk a single step throughout the hospital without getting recognized. But in this case, she knows the amount of pressure to place on a patient. Yeah. For these employees, she snores like an old man. They take a different approach. Meet Apple and Vivian. She is the star. It's all about Apple, it's not about me. Vivian is um, the favorite employee at Huntsville Hospital, Maine. Two four-legged employees working within Huntsville Hospital Foundation's Canines for Coping program. She's very silly without this vest on. This vest is her cue that it's time to go to work. Apple works at Madison Hospital. She's extremely versatile. She sees patients of all ages. We go to the emergency department. Um, I'm so proud of the way that uh, almost single-handedly, Apple can talk to a patient who, who's in a psychiatric crisis and you can see a change in their demeanor. And Vivian works at Huntsville Hospital, Maine. We work with palliative medicine team and hospice patients and families, so during some of their more vulnerable and, and most difficult times, Vivian provides uh, just an immeasurable comfort. Both are known as facility dogs. They know 45 different commands. Who work with their handlers, Angel Utz, a licensed master of social work. Being able to be with people in vulnerable moments and be there to help them hold those feelings and doing it with a dog by my side is pretty much my dream job. And Joe Taylor, a licensed psychological technician. It is an honor to do this. Um, I can't imagine doing anything else. Both of these pups have been professionally trained for service by Guide Dogs of America Tender Loving Canines Program in California. They can open and close doors and drawers. They know how to wave. They know how to give hugs. And get this, Apple and Vivian were both matched with trainers who are incarcerated as part of GDA's prison training program. When a dog is placed with the incarcerated trainer, they spend 24-7 with that incarcerated trainer. During the day, they're out in the play yard with all of the other dogs in training and trainers. Um, and then at night, they sleep in the cell um, with their trainer in a kennel. It's incredibly rehabilitating for the incarcerated trainers. Apple and Vivian have provided unconditional love and support to many. She soaks up a lot of tears. Whether it be at the correctional facility where they were originally trained. Oftentimes they say, you know, this gave me an opportunity to do something good for someone else. Or for hospital patients. Family members say, this is the first time I've seen my husband smile in six months. And staff. She sees staff in the ER who've had, you know, hard codes. Or even for their very own handlers. When that intervention was over and, you know, the patient had passed, um, Vivian's focus instantly turned to me and she did a lap command on the back of my legs, knowing that at that point I needed support. They know what they're meant to do. It is an honor to hold this leash and to be part of the joy that she's spreading to people's lives. And even though their days stay busy, she works hard and in the evenings, just like growing up, she wants to kind of lay around and relax. They still get to be who they are, dogs. At Madison Hospital with the cutest staff, Sedona Meadows, Fox 54 News.
A long and grueling search for not one but two basketball coaches coming to an end recently at UAH. Today, the Charger faithful had an opportunity to meet the new faces of those programs. Alan Sharp will be leading the way for the UAH women. He makes his way to the Rocket City after leading both Wallace State's men's and women's basketball teams to success in recent seasons. He's got 496 career wins and he's ready to bring a successful mindset to Spragans Hall. Sharp says it all begins with recruiting this viewing area. North Alabama high school girls basketball is really good. Middle Tennessee to Southern Tennessee high school girls basketball is really good. So we're in a great location. Obviously the school is tremendous. You know, it recruits itself. So, you know, we're looking forward to it and uh, hopefully we can get things going on the right track. Placing John Showman on the men's side will be Mick Hedgepeth. Standing at six foot nine, he was a standout player at Belmont in the late 2000s. During that tenure, he won three conference championships and made the NCAA tournament twice. As a coach, he's been at Sewanee and Barry, where he's won 82 games in four seasons as a head man. Coach Hedgepeth is very familiar with the tradition of men's basketball at UAH, and he's up for the challenge of keeping the program on an upward track. The high standards here, which are, um, you know, certainly challenging, but also means that a whole lot of people care. And I think that high expectations are a privilege, and, and we're really excited about that. Um, and then on a personal note, to be a part of a university that's growing and thriving alongside the city of Huntsville is really exciting. Welcome into sports. Ten high school basketball players from North Alabama were named finalists for Player of the Year honors. And today in downtown Montgomery, Mr. and Miss Basketball, as well as the Player of the Year winners for each individual class were named. Let's hear from four of them who are from our viewing area. It means a lot, honestly. You know, just putting in a lot of work. And just their support all throughout the year and all the sacrifices my mom, my brother, just my trainers just poured into me. It really means a lot. It's an honor. It's a lot of work put in, and I'm glad I got the outcome that I wanted. I've uh, always looked up to my brother, and he was an amazing basketball player too, but I've finally got to do something that he hasn't. Who would you say you owe this award to the most? Uh, my mom. I mean, she's always, she's really got me into the sport, and she always works with me. She's taught me that it's not just about the sport itself, it's about mental toughness and off the court. I mean, it means a lot. It shows that my hard work has paid off, and it's very rewarding for me. It's very hard because it's like hard on your body, really. And you just gotta like, you can't stay the same every season. Like, yes, I was on top this season, but I had to get up top more. So I just keep working hard, going to the gym every day, and then it's the sacrifice and time and everything. Didn't have the chance to catch up with Caleb in Montgomery, but he did go home with two awards. He's the 6A Player of the Year and Mr. Basketball from the state of Alabama. Caleb, how's it feel to go home with those awards? No, oh, it feels great. Um, winning this award it means a lot to me and my family. You know, it's one of the biggest awards in Alabama history, so it feels good bringing this home for sure. So you are now a two-time state champion, a two-time finals MVP. You are a two-time 6A player of the year. Right. You are Mr. Basketball. You won player of the year for Max Preps and Gatorade for the state of Alabama. And you're only a sophomore. Yeah. What's next, man? Uh, hopefully this year I can make the U-17 team for the uh, USA. We're going to Turkey. So hopefully to make that and, you know, win back to back to back to back state title with Buckhorn. I think it'd be easy for a lot of young men to just sort of sit back. But I can tell you're not doing that. Before we did this interview, you were out here shooting. You were working hard. Where does that drive come from? Uh, you know, it's just my competitive spirit. Um, just, you know, not letting anybody get better than me. Like me always working, just it's me staying hungry. Uh, you know, just me trying to be the best I can be at what I do. What do you think are the one or two things that you need to work on in terms of your personal game as you move towards being a junior? Uh, I think uh, just changing my pace, uh, changing my pace up and uh, me making right weeds. All right, well, that's Caleb Holt, the 6A Boys Basketball Player of the Year, as well as Mr. Basketball from the state of Alabama. From Buckhorn High School in Newmarket, I'm Nick Kuzma. And I'm Caleb Holt. Fox 54 Sports. We'll talk about a crazy coincidence at Huntsville Hospital. Here's what officials told us. Last week, two couples welcomed a new baby into their families. Sounds normal so far, right? Well, here's what's crazy. One couple named their baby Johnny Cash. The other couple named their baby June Carter, names of the late husband and wife country singing duo. Those families, complete strangers, mind you. Congratulations to them, but like, what are the odds? Are we sure they're strangers? Well, that's what they told us. That's what, I mean, it's an odd coincidence. It is a very odd it coincidence. It is, it is. Especially if they don't know each other. I know. 
So we gonna purposely make sure these two become BFFs? And they, then, they have uh, to, man. It's now in the works. It's gotta be in the works, right? It, it's uh, fate, Mo. Correct. There it's you go. Fate. It's in the stars. <laughs> I would like to. Be I like that. That was cute. It was. I would Wow, what are the odds of that? Well, that wraps up this edition of the Week in Review. Remember to check out fox54.com on Saturday afternoons to see the top five lists of most visited stories from our website. Be sure to keep the Fox 54 app handy for breaking news, weather, and sports headlines wherever you are. For the Fox 54 News team, I'm Kenesha D. See you next time.